Good morning again. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Ranveer Chandra, who is a principal researcher at Microsoft Research, where he's leading incubation on IoT applications. Uh, his research is shift as part of multiple Microsoft products. And he also is leading battery research projects uh, project and is co-leading the white space networking project uh, at Microsoft, which I think has uh, some potential impact for what he's going to talk about today. But I want to also mention that he's doing work directly related to our, our uh, workshop. Uh, he's the principal researcher on Food Futures Project and also Farm Beats, AI, and Internet of Things for Agriculture. So welcome, uh, Dr. Chandra. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, hi, I'm excited to be here in an ag school. This is something I've been doing of late for the last couple of years. Before that, I'm primarily a computer scientist. I did my PhD at Cornell. I've been at Microsoft for 12 years, working on different areas of computer science. But most recently, I don't know much of ag. I grew up, I spent, when I was growing up, I used to spend four months every year in India in a farm that my grandparents owned. But other than that, I don't know much of agriculture. I do talk to people who know. I work with farmers, I work with professors. and. Basically, merge what I know in computer science and try to solve some of the hardest problems in farming. So, I want to keep this talk interactive, so do feel free to interrupt in the middle of the talk. And uh, today, I'll tell you some of the research that I'm doing, and even if you, if whatever question you might have, why is Microsoft interested? What is Microsoft doing in this space? I'll be happy to answer them. So, yeah, this work is jointly done with uh, several of my interns and lots of colleagues across different fields, people who do machine learning, computer vision, systems, hardware, networking, and so on. So this is a problem which the audience here knows very well. That is, the, we need to nearly double the world's food production by 2050. And we need to do that without harming the environment. The amount of arable land is limited. The amount of water is, the water levels are receding. We don't want to harm the environment. It's many, many several aspects of it, right? Reduce carbon emissions and so on. And how do we get there? People here are experts in this field, especially if you look at it at a very high level, two, two promising techniques. The first is precision agriculture. People, uh, how do you, in a nutshell, I guess most of the people here have an ag background, but people who don't, it's in a nutshell, it's about selectively applying for any uh, fertilizers, water, nutrients in places where it's needed. Similarly, in more fertile parts of the land, you'd place the seeds closer together. This technology was proposed back in the 70s and late 70s, early 80s. It still hasn't taken off, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And then there are the data-driven improvements, where there was the keynote yesterday, and lots of people have been talking about phenotyping, improving farming practices, and so on. So we have been lead reading the literature, talking to people who are experts in this field, and these are some of the most promising approaches that can help us solve the ag challenge. But what's the problem? The big problem is that of manual data collection. That is, precision agriculture, according to the USDA, hasn't taken off because of the cost of manual data collection. It's not that it can't be done, but it's just very costly. I'll be rushing through the first few parts of first part of my talk because I'm assuming that most people here know what I'm talking about. When I'm talking to a computer science audience, I need to talk a little bit more detail about these aspects. So you would say, OK, you know what? The system is expensive. The, the USDA said that getting all the data from the farms manually is expensive. So how do you solve this problem? The typical way a computer scientist would solve this problem is say, you know what, I'll just put a lot of sensors, connect them to a cellular network, send all this data to Azure or some cloud, do the analysis there, and that solves my problem. This is how your Nest camera at home and most of the systems work. The challenge, though, this is, for example, in the farm. Uh, this is the farm incarnation. We've been doing a lot of test deployments. The closest power source is more than a half mile away, and closest internet is more than a mile away. There is no internet connectivity in the middle of the farm. The other problem is, if you deploy lots of sensors, the cost of management and deploying the sensors goes up, too. So with that in mind, this is when we started the project called Farm Beats. The goal of our project is threefold. First. This is a computer, science, computer scientist's view to the problems in agriculture. And then we want to show, and th this is where I'm very excited to be here, is to then talk about, with all the data that we could collect, what are the new possibilities? What are the new things that we could enable based on that data? So in today's talk, I'll touch upon some of the machine learning problems that we are looking at, but primarily it's about getting the data. 
Right, but do feel free to ask questions again about any of the any of things. So the goal of today's uh, of what we wanted to do is first to be able to get timely data from the farms and make it available to all the agro stakeholders, the farmers, the companies, the distributors, and so on. The second is once we get the data, we're doing a lot of models and analytics on top of that data to feed that information back to the farmer. And the third is to complete the feedback loop. For example, you could have moisture sensors in the field that send all the data to the cloud maybe. You build the model and then you want to automate the sprinkler systems so that you do precision mitigation. So this is the goal. In the first step, we just focus on the first two. The third is a hard problem on its own. So rather than going there, we are all about how do you get the data from the farms and once you get the data, what all can you do on top of that data? And that's the project which we refer to as Farm Beats. So the state of the art is these two. This is what most people do right now. People either use sensor-driven precision agriculture. That is, you'd, go, you'd either manually collect the data or you'd put uh, these sensors that use either cellular or satellite connectivity to send the data to the cloud. The problem with such approaches is it's very expensive. I would, uh, we work closely with UC Davis and WSU. And there, uh, the cheapest, I was at an expo at UC Davis, the cheapest sensors at that expo were five sensors for $8,000 and plus a recurring cost. For a farmer who, who's living on the edge mostly, not making lots of money, this is, a, this is very expensive to buy these, this kind of equipment. The alternative which is taking off is these drone-based systems, which are really cool, these UAVs. However, one of the biggest problems is its battery life. Most of the commercial low-cost drones you buy last barely 20 to 25 minutes. You could go with the more expensive drones, like $150,000 Yamaha, but we're not talking about that in this talk. The other problem with drone-based systems is it's only giving you aerial imagery. It's not telling you what's below the ground. So moisture level six inches below the ground is not what you're going to get from drones. So the vision of Farm Beats is, is the following. We are putting all sorts of sensors, drones, cameras out in the farm. From this data, we merge these, all these data streams to come up with interesting views of the farm. For example, this is just an ortho mosaic, a panoramic view, but we merge these sensor streams to create a, a pH heat map, a temperature heat map, and so on. And once you have this kind of heat map, you can then start building lots of applications on top of it using machine learning techniques. There's some amount of machine learning involved here, but most of it comes then. Once you have a lot of data, can you make these kind of predictive models? So the system architecture is as follows. The way, the way our system works is we first fly the drone, figure out what are the best places to put the sensors in the farm. We, we put these sensors. I'll talk a little bit about what these sensors are. And then periodically, say once a week or once every two weeks, we fly a UAV. A UAV. We get the aerial image. And then so we fly the drone or every once, once or twice a week, but every time, what we do with that is we create a kernel map, a feature function of the entire farm, saying if I have some sensor readings, how can I extrapolate, say from three sensor readings, how can I extrapolate the data for a five acre farm? And that's the feature map that we built using drone imagery, using RGB, multi-spectral imagery, we create that, and then we extrapolate the data. What this means is, even though the drone is flown every, ten, every, every week, the sensor data might be coming every 10 minutes, and every 10 minutes you have an updated heat map for your entire farm. This is the kind of feature that we're able to enable. In another view, this is what our system is. So we have sensors and drones in the farm. We have a gateway that sits in the farmer's house or office, which is right now, it's a downloadable piece of software which will run on any PC. Right now it's a Surface Book running Windows 10, where you download the software, what this does is, this aggregates the data and does machine learning, I'll talk about this architecture as well, where, because drone videos, for example, if you fly a drone for 15, 20 minutes, you'll generate a lot of data, close to a few gigabytes. You can't be sending a few gigabytes to the cloud. Right now, people take it on a USB drive, they move it to another machine, upload it to the cloud, that adds a lot of delay. Here we want to make it completely seamless. From the time a drone lands, it just transfers the data over FTP to the, uh, to the PC, the PC does the, the analysis, the machine learning, and sends only the summaries to the cloud, enough for it to do analytics and provide the other information to all the stakeholders. So if you, in another way to think of our FarmBeat system is it's a complete end-to-end -end IoT system for agriculture, all the way from sensors and drones, moving data to the cloud, to notifications on the farmer's phone, without requiring a human in the loop, without requiring a human to come in to transfer the data, to, to, to move it to, to the uh, analytics. 
so I'll talk about different, comp so as part of building the entire system, we had to do innovation in different, uh, in different parts of the system. I'll talk a little bit about those. The first I'll talk about is the sensors and the connectivity. How do you make the sensors much more ex inexpensive? I talked about the cost. I'll talk about how we make it more inexpensive. I'll talk about drones and the work we are doing there to improve the battery life. The third thing I'll talk about is this gateway. How, what are the challenges here and what we've done. And finally about some of the cloud pieces, the machine learning algorithms that we do there. So the first problem, how do we connect the sensors? By the way, if you have any questions about this, do feel free to interrupt. Yeah, right. So how do we connect the sensors? So as I said, the challenges are connectivity. There's hardly any connectivity in the middle of the farm. People right now, as I said, most of, most of these devices that you buy, they use either cellular or satellite for connectivity. People talk of these mesh networks. We have used them too in the past. My research was on mesh networks back from 2004 to 2008. Those don't work most of the time. They're so unreliable that it's more of a management headache managing these, these mesh networks. Power is another problem. How do you get the system to, to power in the middle of the farm? There are no power lines there, and there are no power outlets. How do you get the system to last long enough? And the, finally, you need to, to work in harsh, unmonitored environments. This is like the stress test for any IoT system, for any IoT sensor. So I'll talk about the, the connectivity piece here. So as I said, most people use connect, uh, cellular or satellite for connectivity. Instead, what we use is a, new, is a technology called the TV white spaces. This was a research project I started at Microsoft from 2005 to 2010. I was actively working on that. In 2010, the FCC chairman visited our campus. It's all legal since then, not only in the US, in US, Canada, Brazil, Singapore, many other countries. So the key insight that we had was that there's a lot of empty TV spectrum available in the rural areas. Before that, let me just tell you what are the TV white spaces. So the TV white spaces, imagine what it could do. If you buy a Wi-Fi router from Best Buy, plug it into your house, and suppose you could access your Wi-Fi router a few miles away. Right now, your Wi-Fi router goes, say, 100 meters. Suppose you could access it a few miles away. The reason it can do that is because it uses the TV channels. So when you're, when you're watching TV, this is over the air TV with rabbit ear antennas, you flip through channels. You, and you see that there are a lot of channels that are missing. There's no transmission going on there. So the technology we had developed was a way in which you could send Wi-Fi signals in any empty TV channel such that it does not interfere with any TV reception. So you could be watching TV at home, and we would be transferring Wi-Fi signals on an adjacent TV channel, and you wouldn't know the difference. So in fact, when we were developing all this, there was a lot of pushback from the TV broadcasters saying, if you use empty TV spectrum, you'll, you'll interfere with us. But that's back then we actually had uh, one of Co Fisher Communications, which is a leading broadcaster in Seattle. We had them over. I showed them that we were transmitting on the channel next to their transmission and not interfering with the reception. So going back, so this is the technology which we, which we call as a TV white spaces, the ability to transmit in any unused TV spectrum. The reason it is so, the reason you get such long range is that we are operating in the TV spectrum. This is in the UHF and VHF bands. What this means is this goes through buildings very well. It also goes through crops, canopies, soil very well. And in the context of farming, the reason this is so important is that TV white spaces refers to unused TV spectrum. The TV channels are where the population are. Where people are is where you'll have a TV tower. Chicago is where you'll have lots of TV towers. As you go further away where the farms are, where fewer people live, there's a lot of empty TV spectrum. There are fewer people. There's no incentive for a broadcaster to set up a TV tower. What that means is there's a lot more empty TV spectrum. There's so much spectrum in farms, in rural areas, that at this point, you can, you can not only transfer small amounts of information, you can transfer videos. Drone videos can be transferred over the spectrum. Now, I'll explain this in a little bit more detail. So if suppose this is the RF spectrum, I don't expect you to know a lot of uh, electromagnetics, but just giving you a, talking at a very high level, this is where your Wi-Fi typically operates, your 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi, your 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi. This is where your TV, TV channels are, much lower in the spectrum. By going much lower in the spectrum, just 101 uh, 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 at a very high level talking to you about wireless, if you reduce the frequency, going by freeze formula, if you reduce the frequency by one-fourth and operate here compared to 2.4, you get four times the range in free space there, if there is no obstruction. If there are obstructions, the propagation is even better. Because here, the wavelengths are bigger. It propagates through walls, through buildings, through crops, canopies very well. 
so just to repeat, the TV white space is refers to any spectrum that is unused. This is in Seattle, which is again a metro, you still have 13 TV channels available. If you go to rural areas, you have huge amounts of spectrum, 200 megahertz of spectrum that is available. So in one slide, I'll capture five years of my research. If you go to my website, you'll see lots of papers written on this topic. But just to give you a very high level overview, which will give you an understanding as to why is this technology any different than Wi-Fi. In Wi-Fi, suppose this is my iPhone, I turn on the Wi-Fi on the iPhone, it immediately starts transmitting. It can access that spectrum right away. Over here, you can't do that. So to give you an idea of why, suppose the x-axis here is frequency, the y-axis is power. This is the view, suppose I turn on my phone, I scan my system. If this is the spectrum that I see, every PU corresponds to a, new, a different TV transmission, a different TV tower. The white space device, which is a radio that would sit on your phone, the, uh, right now I'm talking of phones, I'll talk about sensors soon, but first scan the spectrum, figure out what spectrum is available, not in use by any TV tower. It would then start transmitting in these frequencies, in these white space frequencies. At the same time, it's monitoring to see, hey, if the TV transmission starts, it needs to move away, start transmitting in another part of the spectrum. And if needed, it needs to adapt its bandwidth and power levels. Each one of these are separate papers, multiple of them. We got the best paper award in ACM SICCOM, which is the number one uh, computer science conference. This, uh, this is where the internet and our TCP papers were initially presented. This paper that we talked about, one of the papers got the best paper award at that conference. So this is the core concept of dynamic spectrum access. So, because once we developed this, I've been working on with our colleagues on doing deployments of white space networks in several parts of the world, essentially connecting rural areas to the internet. And uh, we've connected more than, right now, this is a slightly older slide, we've connected more than a million people in different parts. Most recently in India, where we connected five high schools that did not have power, that had never, students had never gone to the internet, we were able to get them connected to the internet. But in the context of farming, uh, as because of what I described, you can see the several benefits of this technology compared to other technologies that you could use to connect these sensors to the internet. And the key insight for farms is that you have lots of spectrum in the rural areas. And at this point, our vision is that just like you use to, to Wi-Fi to connect all the devices in your house, you could be using the TV white spaces to connect all the devices in the farm. These antennas are small. We are not talking of half a million dollars to install a cell phone antenna. These are yay big antennas which you just go plug in the ground. I'll show you some pictures of that. And you could get a few miles of connectivity connecting all the, all the devices, sensors in the farm to the internet. Now people who are working in this field would realize that now you could start getting lots of data from the farms. You could have cameras streaming your plant data all the time, cameras spread all over. Your UAVs could be transmitting data all, all the way to the cloud. And this is what's gotten a lot of companies in agriculture excited about this technology. So what's the range of this technology? Yeah, so this is, um, so in, I'll talk about some of the longest links that we've established. So the FCC in the US allows us to go up to 36 dBm, which is four watts. In, in yeah, I'm getting to that. So in India, we were operating at 31 dBm, which is about 1.5 watts. At 1.5 watts, we got uh, 16 kilometers. That's 10 miles of coverage, and we were transmitting at 2 megabits a second. That's our longest link in India. We had several other links, but that's the kind of range you could get. You could, and the interesting thing is, when in the farms, the FCC now allows you to go even higher at 10 watts. So you can talk of 10 miles, but 15, 20 miles of coverage based on, based on this. Yeah. Right. 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 So those are two separate problems. One is how do you get connectivity to the farmer's house? Then there we are using white spaces for that, working with some wireless ISPs to do that. Here, what we're talking about is the second problem. Once you get the link there, how do you get the connectivity throughout the farm? Yeah. Is there any reason you couldn't use some sort of repeater system to go even further? Yeah, you could. We have done that in a few places, but only gone one hop. The problem with repeater systems is going back to the mesh networks analogy when we worked on that. It's a management headache doing any sort of, and it also loses capacity. The way mesh networks work, they actually lose capacity. So, yeah. so this was one thing I talked about. Now, so connectivity, I'll talk about the other aspects of our system too. So how do you power the devices right now? We are using solar. We actually, in the paper, we talk about uh, how do you improve, how do you, if you could predict the weather 
of what the weather is going to be. You could duty cycle all the devices in rainy days. That's Seattle's is the best. Seattle's the best place to stress test any solar power system. Yeah. So we had to make this work through the winter. So this is where we had to design a lot of hacks into uh, how once you are able to predict the weather, then you duty cycle all the devices so that not all of them are on all the time and still get all the data that you need from the farms. One of the interesting things we are doing is we are partnering with the University of Washington to see if some of the sensors that are in the ground or just above the ground, narrowband sensors, whether they can be powered with RF itself using radio frequencies. Because we are putting a white space tower anyways, why don't we use those antennas to send the signals to power these sensors? But this is still in the research stage. This is uh, not done yet. So now talking about drones, uh, UAVs, what, are the, uh, what is the work we are doing there? Uh, some of the big problems with commercial drones, here I'll only be talking of these commercial UAVs. The reason is the goal of FarmBeats, as I mentioned earlier, was to build this end-to-end -end IoT system for agriculture, which is feasible, which is inexpensive enough that farmers actually buy and use it. So some of the problems with these inexpensive drones for agriculture are, one, you want to make it easy to use. You don't want someone to go with a controller. Yesterday, there was a person from Agribill showing what they've done. I'll talk about our work in that space, too. The second, so the second problem is that of battery life. Usually, these drones would go, say, 20, 25 minutes, the sub-$1,000 drones. How do you increase the battery life of these for these huge farms that are there in the US? And finally, these drone videos are huge. How do you, how do you actually handle them? Right now, most of the people, nearly everyone I know, what they do is they, they have an SD card, they remove the SD card, transfer it to a machine. So how do you make it completely seamless? So the first problem, the drone autopilot uh, application. So what we've done is we've we built this on Android. We're uh, built on for DJI right now. We support all the models of DJI until P4, uh, Phantom 4. So it's a simple user interface. It supports two flight modes. You could either select the endpoints or you could select a polygon. And then once you draw a polygon, it will figure out what is the best path to take. We also, based on that, estimate flight time and so on. So by the way, we also have, most recently, Microsoft had released a drone simulator. This again came out of Microsoft Research, where you could then take a drone and fly it over any area and see how your algorithm would do, what kind of imagery you would get if you flew a drone at a certain location. So going back here, so this is the app. Uh, sorry, I think I might have to click it here. Yeah, so here what, uh, what we do is, so this is the way our app operates. A farmer would go, just mark the endpoints of a polygon. We figure out what is the best path to take. The speed and altitude is something we have as defaults. The farmer could, could override it. So that the farmer doesn't have to go every time and repeat it, we save this. Say, for example, this is a farm in Carnation in Washington, which is about 25 miles east of Seattle. Then our app communicates with the drone, figures out there's enough battery, there's enough SD card, the GPS lock is achieved, the SD card uh, memory is there, and so on. And then it communicates with the drone, and the drone actually takes off. And you can see where the drone is at any instant in time. When, it, when the drone finishes and comes back, lands back, then we automatically transfer this data to the PC, the gateway device that sits in the farmer's house. Now coming to the second problem, how do you, so I showed you how it is, we make it easier to use. The second problem is that of battery life. How do you improve the battery life of drones? Because they, as I said, they're very limited. We come up with two techniques for that. The first is, just to give you an idea of the way most of these UAVs work, is suppose you have to cover this polygon. These are two paths that you could take. The way these UAVs usually work is they'll go from point one to point two, decelerate, change the direction, go from point two to point three, decelerate, change the direction, and so on. So the fewer number of waypoints you have, the better it is for the battery life of the drone. So with that insight, we came up with this algorithm, which we proved is close to optimal, um, with the algorithm, where the key idea is that we pick the longest edge of the polygon and build a path parallel to that edge. And the, the di distance between them depends on the height of the drone. So this is something that uh, the, this, this algorithm, and there's another one. The, the, another, the other idea we had was to leverage wind to improve the battery life of the drone. So if you think of it, uh, uh, it's the same idea that you would use for a sailboat, for example. The drones right now, what they do is, given a particular path, they try to stick to the path irrespective of wind. What we're what we saying is that, in addition to that, depending on the direction of the wind, if you could change the yaw of the drone, 
so that you're reducing the drag. So you use the wind to accelerate and use the wind to decelerate the drone. So these two techniques together, we've been evaluating this in uh, Purdue uh, in Indiana, and we've shown up to 30% improvement in battery life of our, of, of our drone. This paper, by the way, with all these results was recently published in uh, USENIX and SGR, which is again a computer science conference. I would recommend uh, if people who are interested to go read up the work we've been doing here. Now coming to the last part about how do we how do you handle these huge drone videos? So what we want to do is the first step is once we get the drone video, we want to create this kind of a panoramic view. So can we use off-the-shelf software? This was, by the way, this work was the first thing we did two years back, and we the work I'll be talking about is comparing to what existed back then. So this off-the-shelf software worked well for some farms, but when we went to really long stretches, this is about a four-kilometer stretch. These, the, these systems did not work. This is one of the off-the-shelf uh, software that we're using for panorama generation. So what went wrong? The key thing that went wrong is that the, the assumption is that the view is mostly planar, which works in most scenarios except for farms. Right? So here, the, and the farms are also very huge. So this is not what the farm actually looked like. So how can we combat those challenges? So what we do is we, uh, so Microsoft had, a, there's something called the Bing Maps. I don't know how many of you have used it. If you go there, we had something called a bird's eye view. So Microsoft used to fly its planes over cities and then stitch those frames together to create a bird's eye view for anyone. We used the same code and we adapted it to run on a PC. And what that does is basically from a drone video, it first constructs a 3D pipeline, a 3D, uh, 3D point cloud representation, say in this case of the farm, from the video. And then it uses a 3D point cloud to do the stitching. So in this case, this farm was actually something like this, which is a huge stretch. This is a farm in New York where we've been doing our deployments, where the farmer wanted to monitor how his cows are grazing, going from left to right, where the grass is coming back on, and so on. And of course, if there are students who are interested, there are lots of open problems still in drones. So uh, if, there's, if there are any students or academics who are interested in some problems, we have lots of them. One of the new, new things we did there was uh, something called a tethered eye. So I talked about drones and the problem of battery life. Suppose you wanted to cover a region and get aerial imagery of that region for about a week. How would you go about doing that? Right now, you either drones which last a few minutes, or you'd have to go to satellite imagery. So we came up with a new technique, new as in, it's a very low-tech technique. There's not much new in the hardware itself. The key idea is to use a helium-filled balloon, which is tethered, and you add a camera to it, and this camera is like a smartphone. This is what we actually built. And you leave it up there. These balloons could last long. And what we did was we attached a battery pack to the, to the smartphone, your monitoring system could also last a week at that point. The challenge, of course, if you use this approach, is your balloons would move a lot. So that's where what we did was, in software, we were able to stabilize the image. If you're taking a continuous video, as long as you're monitoring, monitoring the gyroscope, you know when your camera is not facing down. If you eliminate those readings, you can, at that point, you actually can build a stable time lapse for up to a week. And once we did this, the farmer in Carnation, he got super excited. He was like, hey, if you can do that for my farm, what I would want to know is, so his farm gets flooded <coughs> periodically in the fall, winter time. And he was, his problem is that whenever there's a flood, he needs to throw away all his crop, all his produce, because of regulations. So he was like, if you can tell me which, which crops the flood actually touched, now this is valuable information. This saves him money. So, and I can't think of any other system that could help us do that. If it's cloudy, your satellites won't give you any information. And if you want such long-term imagery, he needs it for 36 to 48 hours. But even for that, we couldn't think of any other system. But this is something which I won't talk in more detail about. But then again, this is the power of software, right? In software, if you add enough sensors, you can eliminate the frames and still make sense of m most of the data. So now talking about the gateway. So I talked about connecting the sensors. I talked about the, the drones. Now the third piece is the PC that sits on the farmer's house. So before we go there, so what we did was we, did and we went and did a survey of a lot of farmers and talked to professors, talked to companies about what are the services that they would like to provide if they got all this data. So the sensor data could be weather data, which is again some sort of sensor data, drone videos, image streams, cameras in the, in the farm, sensor streams, even notes that a farmer is taking. So we have an app which you give to the farmer where they take notes. Even that's sensor readings. And I'll talk about some services here, and I would love for people to come give me more suggestions or work with us on new services that we could provide. So we talked to them. I'll give you an example. From a drone video, you could take, create a panoramic view. 
right, the ortho mosaic I talked about. You could merge that with sensor streams, say a moisture sensor, and create a moisture heat map for the farm. You could then take the weather reading, come up with a weather forecast for that particular region, and merge it to come up with an irrigation scheduling algorithm for that particular farm. This is one, one of the services that you could provide. We actually talked to them and came up with a huge list of services that they would actually want to provide. And there are much more. And this is where I think we could talk and come up with many more services. The key reason we did this was to figure out what should be the design of the gateway. What data do we need to send immediately to the cloud? And what data can reside on, uh, on the gateway itself? So we went and we figured out, OK, how much data are we sending from one of the, one of the representative farms? How much data are we generating? This is for some of the sensor streams. But not all the data needs to go to the cloud immediately. If you look at some of the constraints, like if a farmer fires this up and queries the sensors, the farmer is looking for a result immediately, right? Near, near, near in real time. Similarly, for livestock monitoring, if my cows left the, uh, if it's outside the farm, if it's outside its fence, it needs to be alerted. The farmer needs to be alerted right away. An interesting uh, sin uh, scenario was, again, the farmer incarnation. They have a bear. Uh, it's a tame bear. It's, a, it's, not, it's not a wild bear. It comes and just before harvest, it eats up all the red lettuce in his farm. Not the green ones, just the red lettuce. And this is a notification. We don't notify the farmer right away that the lettuce is gone. Right? So these are, again, cases where you want immediate response to the sensor data that you collect. But some of the others, like irrigation scheduling, you could tolerate a latency of a few hours. For others, if you're doing variability analysis for the farm, what does the soil look like and things, you could wait for weeks, or days, weeks, or even a month. So in the typical scenario, what you would do, which is what I talked about earlier, is you would take all this data, ship it to the cloud. But that's not the case in farms. In some, most of the farms that we work on, you either have weak connectivity. This is some of the problems I talked about. Or there's a network outage. This is how do you con connecting the farmer's house to the internet. That connection goes down often. Like, for example, there was this uh, blizzard recently. And then we lost the connection to the farm in New York where we were doing our deployments. So how do we solve a problem? This, the, the challenge here is we want to design a gateway that can operate even when the connection to the cloud is weak. And it can also operate when the connection to the cloud is gone. When you're disconnected, the system should still be up and running. Right? So how do we get there? The key idea here is to we, uh, create a panorama, merge it with the moisture sensors, and create this framework is what I had talked about initially. Once you create this, this kernel function of how different sensor streams, how they vary throughout the farm, you only need to send that to the cloud. You don't need to send all the panorama, the entire panorama, to the cloud all the time. So the way we do that is we formulate it as a training problem. How do we construct the heat map? We first frame it as a training problem. These sensors give you training data. Based on that training data, you actually predict for all the other parts in the farm what that value is. This is one simple machine learning formulation. We had two key insights. One insight is spatial smoothness. That is, areas that are close to each other are likely to have the same value. The second uh, key insight was that of visual smoothness. That is, areas that look similar have similar sensor values. Similar could be in RGB, your regular visual images. It's also, it could be similar in the multispectral domain as well. Right? So based on these two insights, we basically have built a simple Bayesian function. So we take the visual features, xi, and this is the input. Suppose you fly a drone, or you have these visual features, and the output is yi. So based on that, we build, we learn this kernel function w. What this does is basically it's modeling visual similarity. And then we add to it the spatial smoothness, k. And then we learn w and k based on the sensor values, based on the raw ground truth for the points where we have sensors. We use that to learn the, learn the kernel function w and k. And every, after that, every time you get a new sensor reading, we then predict this output, say moisture, pH, your soil nutrient, and so on. This is built using simple Gaussian processes right now, which, which works reasonably well up to, say, 100 sensors. So the other thing we use this, 
once we get this kind of a Bayesian, uh, this uh, this framework, this Bayesian framework, we build we build the kernel function. We also use that to decide where should we place our sensors. Suppose you had only five sensors available, where in the farm should you place the five sensors to get the most information? We basically use this thing called value of information. So, Bhaskar, you might know this stuff really well. So, we use value of information to decide what are the best places to put the sensors to get the most valuable information. So, in this case, for example, you'd put one in green, one in brown, this is just for illustration purposes, and one where it is dark. The interesting thing is for this farm, we were able to predict regions, even though we didn't have sensors in those regions, we actually did the evaluation, and we were very close to what the actual predicted values, actual measured values were. And to give you a system's insight, the reason this kind of a function is important is because the drone videos is of the order of gigabytes. This high res panoramic image is of the order of 100 megabytes, but this is less than a megabyte, a few hundred kilobytes, and this is all that we send to the cloud. So if you have a weak connection, most of the farmers that we work with have an internet connection at home of about one megabits a second, two megabits a second. This amount of data is not a problem to send to the cloud, even if you have a weak internet connect connection. So for your machine learning, um, mm -hmm. soils are often heterogeneous. Mm -hmm. you also and many of the soils in the US have been mapped. Yeah. So are you using soil qualities also in your learning? So not yet. This is something that we just hired a soil scientist in the group. He just finished his PhD from WSU. And he's helping us define soil quality and come add it to them all. Yeah. yeah. So then we use all that to build this particular system. This is, as we call a system deep edge, this particular box, which is, a, which is what's sitting on the PC, all the components that run on the PC. We take camera data which is streaming into the, again, it's a video processor that sits on the gateway, and we're running CNNs. These are some deep learning routines that we're running, running on the gateway itself, not pushing all the data to the cloud. For example, doing simple monitoring, I'll show you some of the deep learning things, monitoring the cows, where the cows are clustered, monitoring whether there's a human in the farm store, monitoring the farm where there's a bear, all that stuff can be, can be run on this CNN that's running on the gateway. Otherwise, you'd have to send all the data to the cloud. The other thing is every time you get a new drone video, it's sent via FTP, we generate a panorama. And every time you get new sensor readings, which are sent via MQTT, you generate the heat map. And once you have that particular module, then you can run all those ag services on top of it. The ones in green are the ones we've implemented. But the way we th think of it is this is where we need to work with people who are experts, who can help us design many other services, like yield prediction, soil, uh, soil, soil prediction, and so on, which you'd build on top of it. We also have a drone flight planner that sits here, a cloud sync module that takes the data and ships everything to the cloud. The interesting thing is this is the way you would typically design a gateway. If you talk of IoT gateways, the edge, this is new. No one really has done deep learning at a, at a gateway, IoT gateway level yet. This is, we believe, the first time anyone's taken a stab at it. There are two other aspects of our system which are actually new. Uh, coming at it again from the design of a computer science perspective. One is storage. That is, we store unique data on the gateway that we don't ship to the cloud ever. Things like the drone video. If I'm capturing a four gigabyte drone video, we won't transfer the entire four gigabytes to the cloud. We keep it locally on the gateway. The, the, the reason this is also important is then this can also run in offline mode. Because all the data is stored here, even if you lose the connectivity to the cloud, the system can still keep running in offline mode, even when the system is, the, the internet is disconnected. The other interesting thing is because you're storing unique data at the gateway, you can provide services that you wouldn't be able to provide in the cloud. For example, because we have a, the entire drone video here, we provide a web ser a service called a, a 3D walkthrough of the farm. So a farmer can be sitting in the house and be doing a detailed 3D walkthrough of the farm. And that is possible because we are only storing the data at the gateway, not pushing it all the way to the cloud. Like these are all components that are important to, to build the entire machine, free, machine learning framework on top of it. The other interesting aspect of our system is that based on the connection from the farm to the cloud, if it's a very strong connection, we could move all the components of the gateway to the cloud. But if the connection is weak, say, if it's a, we, we monitor the connectivity from the farm to the cloud and decide which components do we run on the gateway and which components do we run on the cloud. This is a simple optimization function that we do. So now, we, I talked about all the different steps in our system from sensors to drones to the gateway and the cloud. Now I'll talk about what all we, what, how, some of our deployments and what are our learnings, what are the applications that we built on top of it. So we've done deployments in two farms. One is a 2,000 acre farm in upstate New York. 
The other is a farm incarnation, which is about 100 acres. This is where we do most of our deployments. This is a V1 of our sensor, but the key way our system works, you should look at it from right to left, is we take the, the sensors, move it to an IoT hub, which then talks over the white spaces to a gateway device that sits in the farm. Right now, we are, uh, we are building a system where this directly talks to the gateway without an IoT hub in the middle. This is, as I was saying about the white space antenna, this is what it is. This is the white space device, this is an antenna you just plug in in the farm and your entire region around it gets connected. These are the solar panels that are driving our entire system in the farm. So just go back here. This is um, some sensors. We have a camera for some phenotyping experiments that we are helping some of the people with. Uh, this is the kind of heat maps that we're able to generate. This is, for example, a, a moisture heat map. The interesting thing is we were able to predict this moisture here without having an explicit sensor. As you can see, this is quite wet. And the reason we were able, we were able to predict this without having an explicit, mo explicit sensor there. This is the power of, again, of machine learning. Right? You have few sensors, you merge it with aerial imagery, and you can extrapolate and get the data in, in regions where you don't have sensors. This is something I was, I, I was talking to Steve Long, Professor Steve Long, uh, yesterday. In, he's in the Ag School here. And he was saying that even in farms in Illinois, there's the moisture levels vary by more than 50% in, in a small area. And he, he, he was very interested in this problem. He was like, hey, can you come up with a more detailed moisture heat map? This is one way we are doing it. The other interesting one was the pH heat map. So this is a sensor which gives us reading from 1 to 4. 1 is dry, 4 is wet. Oh, this is, this is, a, this is about a five-acre farm. Yeah. So in this case, there were three sensors. Uh, I think I, I don't know if I, I could just tell you one. The three sensor example I gave earlier was where we had one was here, one was here, one was here. So just three sampled based on. So this is an area we first. So when this was dry, when there was uh, when there was no grass, we did the aerial survey. Based on that, we figured out where should we putting this. Where should we putting the sensor? And we put three of them on this land. No, it just had a, this was done, the first one was done using RGB only. Now we are integrating this with multispectral imagery. Maybe we can take it afterwards, but you have to either have the prior or the sensor for that, right? There is no magic. No, so, yeah, there's, so basically every time you do aerial imagery, you're also getting the raw ground truth data from the sensors. Yeah, yeah. So this is another heat map for the pH sensor. So each of these sensors also had a pH. We're monitoring moisture at three different depths a pH sensor, soil temperature sensor. So this is a pH sensor, which is giving the pH heat map for the farm. As you can tell, this is after the farmer had applied lime. And after that, we pointed out these regions, which are still very acidic, which was he had to reapply lime based on uh, in those regions to maintain the neutrality. We also did for the farmer the analysis of how much water he saves, how much pH he saves. In this case, it was uh, this is a small holder farmer, the one in Carnation. He was saving 44% uh, less lime, 30% less water. This, again, all the data is in the paper, which is, again, on my website or on the Farm Beats website. The other interesting scenario we had was with the panorama. This is for the farmer in New York, where you fly the, fl fly the plane. Once you create this panorama, then you can do all the machine learning to find out where there are water puddles. This needs to be fixed for the next season. Where there is cow excreta, if the cow are pooping well, if the, if the land is getting enough, uh, enough manure, the cows are moving well. Where the cow herd is right now, when there is a stray cow, all of this can actually be uh, this is all machine learning on top of the drone videos. Once you create this panorama, these are the simple machine learning uh, systems that we built. I was talking about the 3D walkthrough, so this is just for illustration purposes. Because we store all the data in the in the gateway, we are able to provide this kind of a feature, which is a 3D walkthrough of the farm, where the farmer can be in the house, can see where exactly the drone is, what would the image look like, can move it to another part and, and just zoom in and see what the farm looks like. This is, again, just for illustration purposes, I'm showing it like this, but you can imagine if you had an uh, AR, VR system, like you had a HoloLens or you had Oculus Rift, you could create really fancy imagery, really, a really immersive experience for the farmer. This is, again, a cow shed monitor where we are monitoring uh, cows, where the cows are clustered together. And especially in the winter is some is the time when the farmer actually cares about it. A similar thing for chicken, for sheep, for uh, for pigs, such kind of a system would be useful. 
So yeah, to conclude the talk, so I talked about this Farm Beat system, which is an end-to-end -end IoT system. That's the way we think of it. A lot of it is also plumbing, that is taking research that's already done, putting it together, and to create the system to gather data and provide interesting insights on top of it. I think we are at a stage where we know how to plumb everything together. The insights is where we need more partnerships, more work with different, uh, different companies. We are working with them, different uh, academics, people who are experts in the field, to build more services on top of this IoT system. Yeah. Thank you. Earlier, you, you were doing some work in terms of the the, uh, mm -hmm. the spectrum. And, sorry, and using using it in uh, in Southern Africa. Yeah. Uh, to to but there was largely a, uh, an attempt to try and get more people access internet. to to internet. I, so I do that, that's the space where I work in. And so so I mean it's it's it, the the needs in terms of data are screamingly large. And obviously in terms of making an impact in terms of food security. I mean here you're getting you have people that are getting sort of one tenth of the recommended yield on their farms. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's right. being able to improve that a little bit can make a huge difference, right? Exactly. But you also have, I, mean, I was shocked, I work in Zambia, there's about 20 weather stations for an area the size of California. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, we don't have good precipitation data. I mean, just the, the sort of yeah. basic data needs are huge. Right. Right. So I, any, I have to say, have you, have you thought about taking yeah. some of these applications to even even putting together, you know, right. decent precip yeah. data? Yeah. 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 yeah, no, so that's a very important question. This is very high on our mind. So that's why we've started this effort in India, where we are working with ICRISAT, we are working with uh, people there in the Andhra Pradesh government, with the Gates Foundation closely on so the similar problems, and one is connectivity. So we are driving down the cost of sensors a lot with the goal, the, the initial one we built is around $100. We want to get it to less than like $20, $30, or even lesser. At that point, you can spread it out in all over the country. Like in India, one of the other interesting machine learning problems is that of weather forecasting. Yes. The, the thing you mentioned where, well, they have few weather stations. In India, they have quite a lot, but the problem there is that the old data so usually the way you would do weather prediction is take 30 years data and predict what the weather would be like. The old data is all wrong. It's, it's incorrect data. So all your predictions are wrong. So there, one of the ideas that we're trying to explore is if you have many of these smaller mini weather stations that you could put all, yeah, ac all across, yeah. which, is not, which might not be as accurate, but can, it, can you use it to enhance the existing predictions? So that's one of the problems we're looking at. We're also working on just irrigation problems in India, because a lot of uh, agriculture, there's dry land agriculture. If it is dry land, then can you tell something more about the soil? How can they treat the soil? And that's where soil type becomes important. Yeah. So, but yeah, there's a whole list of things we are doing in India, and we'd love to chat. And Africa is high on our mind. We are getting lots of requests, and we'd like to try something there. If you have connections, if you have people on the ground, you know, we'd love to try that. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. So, question about storing the yeah. uh, storing the the raw drone images mm -hmm. locally. Right. Um, what's your plan for that long term? And the reason I'm asking this is. Right now, you're extracting certain information from it, mm -hmm. sending it up, doing okay. your analysis. But what, what is very difficult to get are multiple years. So we can always say we can yeah. get more drones data. That's true. Yeah. But collecting drone data over I, time yeah. series is really valuable data. So I are you agree. some plan to collect that stuff from the, the local storage? I agree that we need that. We absolutely need that. And one of the features we are building is right now is to do a time lapse of the drone imagery, right? Like you talked about time lapses yesterday. We are looking at if you have this drone ortho mosaics, which might not be overlapping. So how do you orient them together? Build this kind of a, a 4D time lapse to some extent, right? So that's but one of the big challenges we run into is data, and because it's very fragmented. I think this entire data problem is its own, uh, who owns the data? Right? Is it the farmer who owns the data? Is it the person who flies the drone who owns the data? I think it goes back to that. And that needs to be sorted out before we build this kind of a repository. Right? But this is a very important problem. And you'd love to contribute if there is such a source, if we have the permissions. My guess is with the farmers we work with, they won't have a problem. But yeah. In fact, the farmer I was work with in New York, he's a CSA farmer. So he actually delivers his products to these consumers. And he was like, hey, you know what? I could use the videos that you generate, the images that you generate for marketing. 
and he wants to use it for marketing. He wants to put it out there, right? So. Now, I noticed he had horses. So I mean. Oh yeah, he's a crazy guy. Okay. So you should actually. He's the highest tech Microsoft technology. Though. Yeah. Right. No, so you should actually talk to him. This guy is uh, Mark Kimball and his wife Kristen Kimball. She was actually a New York Times reporter. They, she she's written a book called The Dirty Life, which is an Amazon bestseller. It's all about her life, how she moved from the city to a farm, and he just came about. Uh, I came to know him through personal connections, and I just like talking to him. He's. So he uses horses in about 10% of his farm, and he wanted to use it throughout, but he just uses it in 10%. The other part is tractors. Yeah, yeah. So following up on what Pat had said, the notion of storing data. Um, uh -huh. Maybe one more insight would be you just store temporal data based on assumption of temporal smoothness, right? So you just store data when there's a change in some pattern right. that you know, and then that'll or to store to reduce the storage. Yeah. yeah, that's right. That's right. For for. The thing with, yeah, you could do it. The, right now, we are flying it infrequently enough. Th that, is, that is our trigger for a flight, is when something changes is when you go fly it. But you're right, that even then it could be overlapping and you could compress it. That's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, uh, I'm a graduate from Michigan State. Hi. And um, I was, I, I wanted to ask, why is Microsoft after this kind of research and what were, what were you expecting? So um, the reason, so in Microsoft research, we do all kinds of wacky stuff, right? Like if you think of the TV white spaces thing, we're doing work on quantum computing. We are doing work on, so they could, so in Microsoft research, we do hire PhDs, all of, all of them are PhDs, and we look at things five, 10 years down the line. The reason I picked agriculture as one thing Microsoft should focus on is, <laughs> One, because of my passion. I, uh, growing up in India, growing up in farms, I've seen farming in India is very different, and I've been through that. Right? So I want, to, I want to make farming more data-driven. That's my personal goal. From a company's perspective, what, I was, what I'm trying to design is an end-to-end -end Internet of Things system, and to see how Microsoft's cloud, Microsoft's gateway can be better prepared for it. And if you think of building, like an IoT system would be like even your home, like like Alexa system, or all of them would be IoT systems, right? But the hardest one to design is the one for the farm. And that's why, that was one of the motivations why I started working on this project, thinking about how can we make Microsoft's cloud, or Microsoft's IoT system, or Microsoft's AI more ready for the different challenges. And agriculture is a huge vertical. If you think of it, it's a $4.5 trillion vertical, right? There's so, that's the amount of business that drives and all of us eat food. So if Microsoft can play a role, it'll be big. So we do think three to five years down the line. And the other thing is we also work a lot with all the partners, all the big companies you can think of are companies we work closely with so in ag. And so that's another reason why whatever we are doing is kind of grounded in what the problems that farmers face, the problems, the problems that these companies face. Yeah. Yeah. You show a uh, few of the examples in, in animals, and in the end, you show one inside the barn and with some measurements. But a cow likes to move around and stay in front of the camera, so how accurate are those yeah, measurements? No, so it, actually, I should go back here. Uh, yeah, you can see these cows are facing back too, right? So you can be able to, even from the back, be able to. And this is just this is a very simple training we did. Just look for cow images on the internet. Use that to train it, and with that, if you have cows facing back, their tail is visible, right? So, and that's all we are using. All we need to know is how many cows are there and what is the cluster of cows. That's all we are trying to infer here. Not trying to identify the cow. If we had to say this cow is cow number something, <laughs> or his name is or her name, is, then it becomes challenging. Right? But for this particular application, it was much easier. Yeah. Hi. Thanks. Hi. Um, I came in slightly late, so this might have been addressed, so I'm sorry if so. Um, but looking at the systems you're developing here, who, how are you imagining rolling these out? You said you're working with partners. Are, is this research that, say, like Agco or Deer are going to be using? Or uh, are you imagining yourself in competition with companies like Centera or Precision Hawk, like other drone companies? Or is this something you're trying to develop for free? Mm -hmm. How are you thinking about implementing this or rolling right. it out? So right now when we are doing research, so we are doing end-to-end -end research here, right? So including working in agriculture, working with agronomists, working with professors in agriculture, trying to build the complete system. And then we'll see which other parts Microsoft should own. Most obviously what Microsoft should be doing is the cloud. This is where we, we are number two in the cloud right now. We would like to get to number one. And if we can make a cloud ready for agriculture, that allows everyone 
any company, we are not trying to go into job. We are not building tractors. We are not building seeds. But the kind of analytics they want, the kind of data they want, is something that the machine learning could be done on the Microsoft Cloud. Right? We might not be doing the entire machine learning ourselves, but if we provide the appropriate tools to let developers start building their own services on top of those tools, is something that we could provide in our cloud. I can't get into more details, but I guess this kind of answers your question. Yeah. Yes. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Heather. I'm from North Dakota State University. Hi. And in my group, we did a lot of research based on the UAVs. So I got a question about the sensors from uh, your company. Uh, what's the coverage, uh, the coverage area uh, per sensor? And uh, how do you deal with like the very big, uh, large size field? Like how many sensors do we need in a very large field, like a uh, couple hundred acres? Yeah. yeah, thanks. Yeah, no, so like the farm in New York is 2,000 acres. So the way we decide how, how many sensors to put is, again, based on the heterogeneity of the farm. Like the farm in Carnation is very heterogeneous, so we needed more sensors. Because it gets flooded, the, far, the, the dynamics of the farm is much more. So we needed to put more sensors in the Carnation farm. The farm in uh, New York is much more homogeneous. Usually, the big farms are more homogeneous, so we need fewer sensors. But the thing there is, usually, in a research phase, we put more. And then we try to take things out and say how many actually were needed. So in a 100 acre farm, if, I, if you could give us the coordinates, we can do our own analysis and try to get back to you. The range of these sensors is pretty big. It's about, uh, so as I said, 10 miles. Right? 10 miles are broadband. If, I'm, if I have a camera, I could get 10 miles. If you're talking of a sensor sending few bits of information, then it'd be 50, 60 miles. Right? Because then the narrow band you go, the more range you get. Right? It's the SNR uh, equation. Yeah. So the quality of data from UAV, the imagery we get is great, except it's an indirect proxy of what the actual value is. So that's why instead of using NDVI directly, what we are doing is trying to, NDVI is a good metric, for example, that you could infer from UAVs, but the, they are still indirect measures of what the crop health is, what the soil health is, what the soil moisture is, say six inches below the soil. The sensors themselves are great, but the more inexpensive sensors you go towards, the more uh, fluctuating the data. So we have to do some cleaning even after we get the data in the cloud. So we are building routines just to filter the anomalous ones out unless it's a real anomaly. So what we're doing there is looking at correlations across different, uh, different sensor values, for example, soil temperature and soil moisture, and try to see if something's anomalous. If it is, then either it's a problem with the sensor or there's some incorrect reason. So we do flag those, and we have had failures of the sensors. That's not a problem we've been able to address yet. but. Yeah, the quality of the sensors for the we do have some more accurate ones. Uh, the, the the sensors they are they are good. They last long, and they do do provide accurate readings. And we haven't had a problem with them. But yeah. So basically, you're talking about the same data. Mm -hmm. So there are distinctly different data that you get from UAVs. Yeah, yeah. UAVs give us uh, these RGB images, like the cow in example I was mentioning here. The this one, this you couldn't get with sensors, right? You needed UAVs for this. So the, the UAVs are giving us a totally different stream of data, which you can do for this kind of analysis, for yield prediction, you'd use that data. So UAVs are giving us a totally different stream used for other applications. Sensors are giving us a different stream. And if you merge them together is when you start getting a new set of services that you could build on top. So uh, three-part question. Mm -hmm. Looking forward to when you have these implemented, um, how robust is the system? Mm -hmm. um, how much do the farmers worry about whether it will be robust? And what measures do the farmers need to have in place in case it fails? OK. So uh, the first one, how was how robust is the system? So the system is, so it's gone through multiple iterations. It's still a research project. It's not something where we can give it out and say, hey, you know what, you won't need us anymore. We are still involved all the time. We have people, whichever farm we work with, we have academics close by we engage with who go and fix the problems. Whenever there's a problem, they'll go fix it. The problems, surprisingly, a lot of times have been related to, um, so one is reliability of the sensors. So that's, again, as I was saying, this is something we've been iterating time over and over again, trying to make it more reliable. Reliable in the sense, 
once the farmer, it, it, some things just come off because these are boards that we put together, either uh, an animal went over it or those kind of problems, which we are still trying to fix. The, uh, I think more or less we are, we are at a point where the gateway is very stable, the cloud services are stable, the drone part is quite stable too, the sensor reliability is something we are working on more actively to get them more reliable. The farmer, they are very excited to get this kind of information. They didn't have this information, so we see a lot of excitement from their perspective, and they are the ones who report, hey, this one seems wrong, how do we, they don't know how to diagnose it, but that's when we kick in remotely, we try to try to debug this. And the third question was, uh, what is the third question? How, how would you advise Just thinking about the farm as a system and then your, your potential, um, your IoT end-to-end uh, -end as a part of the system, you would advise somebody to have measures in place and to be prepared, even though they're reliant on the system, right. and they should be prepared um, in case it does Something not breaks. work. Yeah. And so how, how do you educate people uh, to be prepared to fill in the gaps? Right. And, and right. this may be looking too far ahead because you're still in the research phase and right. so... No, so we are, so even from a research perspective, there's another interesting problem I did not talk about is that of fault tolerance. That is, we don't want the farmer to go out in the field and try to debug something and try to see what's going on. So there again, it's again, we pose it as a machine learning problem. We're using, a, again, a Bayesian framework, a dependency graph across all the different sensor readings, drone readings, so that we can exactly say what's gone wrong. But that's an open problem. That's something which I completely agree. We are still in the phase of getting everything to work and then and trying to add a lot of debugging information. But this is going to be the next big challenge as to how do you, however reliable you make your system, it will fail. Cloud has 99.999% of reliability, but still there's a small percentage that it could fail. And when it fails, we all suffer, right? The mail is gone the, and so on. So the more reliable we make it, the more dependent we can make farmers on this. But I think that's the, that's the next stage. Is any experience with the passive wireless sensors? The passive, uh, like which ones? I... So there is the new the technologies on the of passive thing? sensors, the wireless sensors. Oh, the RFID kind of thing? Yeah. Yeah, the problem with RFID is the range. So there is still, it'll go a few meters be at best, right? Usually RFIDs are one meter, two meters. You can stretch it to 10, 15 meters. The latest one someone showed was 80 meters. Still, it. Without, then at that point, you'd still need to use a multi-hop network to get the data across. We are actively following that space. I work closely with the U University of Washington people that I was talking about for powering the sensors. They're also building a system to do backscatter communication where, like RFIDs, your data will just get reflected completely through passive sensors. But the technology is still, like it's still not there. It's still a few hundred meters away, talking of miles, right? So, yeah. Thank you. Question about the uh, ownership of the of the images or the data that's processed. Are you envisioning that uh, that would reside with the farmers, or is it was Microsoft expecting some access, and and are any of those images going to end up in the public space? That's the question that Pat asked too, and I don't know what the answer to that is. Who should own it? This is where I think. Personally, I would feel that it's farmers. It's the farmers' data. It's their farm. If they want to sell it, they sell it. But I don't know the answer to this. This is where I think we'll have to talk to the right privacy people. We'll have to see what the right business model is. I don't know, right? Because it's the totally two different extremes. Satellite data, well, the farmer doesn't own the satellite data. And you could go at five meter accuracy, even lower, to try it off the farmer's farm. Now, of course, it's not getting information all the time, but it is getting that aerial emission. Now, who owns the drone, where well, the drone owner gets the data? I, that's a question completely different. And so it's a business model question, it's a data privacy question. I think, personally, uh, yesterday I was meeting a computer science professor in UIUC, I was there in that department, talking to the professors here, and I told them about this problem, about the privacy problem. And because it's like, if you think of it like kind of blockchain, right? So one example could be, hey, the farmer, so this was a simple example where, suppose the farmer's packing some produce, and 
he wants to convey some information about the produce to some people along the way, but different people get different amounts of information. So how would, how could you, it's kind of like blockchain, but a different kind of blockchain here, right? So how would you build such a system? And that's the kind of question I was brainstorming with the computer science professors here. But I think it's still, it's an important question. It's something which, it has a business aspect to it, it has a privacy aspect to it. The privacy aspect itself has a research angle to it. So I think it's something which would need a lot of work to, to solve that problem. And what about costs? And of storing your, your, the data, of hosting that data? Yeah, just the whole system and what do you envision? Oh, this farm beat system? Yeah. So this farm beat system is what we wanted to, so this was one of the goals, to drive down the cost a lot, right? So at every step, we are talking using off-the-shelf drones. Drones are still the most expensive piece of our system. It's still $5,000. The sensors, the goal is to get it sub-100 even now, but eventually like tens of dollars, if not even lesser. The gateway, that's why we use an existing PC. The assumption was most farmers have a PC. If they have a PC, it's just a downloadable piece of software. So we're trying to drop down the cost of all the, all the pieces in the, in the chain, where once it gets to software, it's about a lot of the learning that we do. So the, the key monetization angle here ideally should be analytics, right? What kind of analysis can you do? Making everything else more commodity. That's happening everywhere, right? For even phones, it's, the prices are dropping down. People are trying to monetize services. In IoT, your sensors in the home, Amazon sells those sensors for really cheap, right? They, they fire stick because they want to monetize on, on the data, on the services that you could provide. Farming is not like that. Even right now, the cheapest sensors, the cheapest gateways, gateways, I was looking at some farming gateway, tens of thousands of dollars. Why would anyone buy it, right? It's like, we're trying to bring the cost down. Now, to come up with an exact value, we'll have to see what is the size of the farm, how many sensors are needed. That will be the cost of the hardware, the cost of the software, the analytics system. So we had a, oh, anyways, thank you, nice presentation. Thank you. Uh, first is, we had a, a discussion yesterday about the lack of ground truth data that we can do a lot of machine learning algorithms and then give you an yeah. answer, but sometimes it's a challenge to know what's the quality of that answer and, right. and all of these systems, a lot of it, the value for the farmer is predicated on the quality of the predictions. Right. So when you're, like for example, you had a, a, where you said you can put out a few sensors and then the modeling right. Right. process can do a really nice job of sort right. of imputing where you don't have information. So do you have suggestions on, you know, how, how to approach that problem the where it's like what, what right what's the ground truth I mean we can we can right. fill in the gaps but how right. how well are we doing at that right right with our system because we had the ground truthing sensors it helped us a lot and then we would deploy much more and then try to take some out to try to do the prediction so that's why we had the ground truth but the problem comes up often especially if we're getting drone videos and we're trying to extrapolate something from the ground how do we know what the ground truth is similarly the other interesting problem is for Yield prediction. We are trying to do yield prediction, but we don't know what the ground truth was. What's the error in well, what the what the predicted yield was? So uh, this is a this is a hard problem. I think here what we need to do is get more. So for some data, like the sensors we talk about, there just deploying more sensors solves a problem. For quite a, many others, like even measuring the nitrogen content, you can't be getting soil samples all the time. How do you even get that data? I think it boils down to uh, some way to get the farmer to convey all the information that they have and to capture it in a way which can be used for machine learning. Right now what we are doing for the two farms is one is we've given them an app to take notes. But notes are very coarse grain, very raw, and right now we still don't have a good way to mine it. But I think if we can make that structure, that is for your farm, try to log this data. I think that is one input that can help a lot with ground truthing. The guy in New York, what we did, the farmer there is, they, they use Trello. This is like a like OneNote, this is like a collaboration software. They have a lot of data there. That's, what's, that's the other thing we're trying to mine. Even there though, it's still text. So it's a hard problem, and I think one different stream which I think we are not tapping into is raw ground truthing by, ground truthing by the farmers themselves. And that could be someone like Agribal was here yesterday. They have this app. They could be the ones capturing it. Or someone needs to do it. Right. Right, so the related question is the accuracy of all the machine learning algorithms. So what has That's your true. experience been? Mm -hmm. And it's kind of a couple of part questions. So first is when you were detecting cows or you know the other things, right. uh, did you have false positives and so on? The, and then the follow-up question is what is the cost of false positive or true negative in this space? And the last part is are there other sanity checks 
like mm -hmm. on web, they do A-B experiments because those machine learning algorithms are very inaccurate. Right? That's true. That's that's very yeah. true. The way, uh, so machine learning, initially I was a skeptic of machine learning, primarily because I would think that because of the probabilities involved, right? It's like, it's essentially what we are doing here is we have a bunch of equations and we are trying to do coefficients come up with coefficients for that, right? So there is there is this problem of error. Although if you look at it, over the years, especially the deep learning frameworks have gotten better and better. The latest models like the ResNet, it can give you 80% plus accuracy. But it's still 80%, it's not 100%. So I think we should be careful when using machine learning for certain problems. That is, problems where you can tolerate the error. Like if I'm doing yield prediction, I'm within 20, 30% and if it's tolerable. For cows, if I'm doing clustering, and more or less if I'm doing it over a longish period of time, if that's what I'm doing, it's fine. If I was doing cow identification, it becomes a totally different ballgame. I know you'll get it wrong, right? Mo wrong enough times that, that the value of the service won't be good. So we have to be careful in figuring out which particular problem we solve and problems where we can tolerate the uncertainty and still it adds value, like predictive things. There we are giving an insight. And this is where I was talking to some of the big companies and they were talking about pest infestation. They were like, you know what, we only have 60 or 70% probability of getting that fixed. But even then, this thing sells. People buy it, right? So I think that's that's the kind of inaccuracy. If you're able to deal with the inaccuracy, then it's okay to apply the machine learning problem, uh, machine learning as a solution. Otherwise, it's better to go with deterministic approaches. And of course, with machine learning, if we can do these sanity checks, that of course helps a lot. Like what I was uh, telling you earlier was. We're actually using machine learning to do sanity checks in some cases. Like I was saying about the inaccurate sensors where we're getting soil moisture and getting soil temperature. Can we say that one reading is wrong because something else is giving you another value? That's again using prediction of some kind, but using it for sanity checking. But yet, whether you'd use machine learning for your life, now people are trying to do it with, auto with autonomous cars, right? That's self-driving cars. So it's getting there. I think we're not there yet for, for, for all applications. Do you think that a small robot would be useful for taking a few images or yeah. all the images that you, you need you can get with drones? I don't think it's a replacement for drones. I think it would be a huge, or it would be a big, a very useful data stream, an extremely useful data stream. We work with apple orchards, and they, they have this apple counting problem. They want to know how many apples are there, and they can't get drone imagery because the apples are hanging down. That's one scenario. Then similarly, there are many others where I think ground imagery can give you very complementary information. And we would love to integrate that as part of our, how we are doing the sensor fusion or aggregating it in a way where we could get even ground robots and that data to be streamed through the gateway to the cloud to provide the analytics to the farmers. I think that's something which should be very useful. Yeah. Hi. Um, how, far the, how far away is this system from, from commercialization? And then who are the major customers you're targeting on? I saw you listed seat vendors and agronomists and farmers. Well, this here. is the target. So don't think of okay. it as they are the customers. Even with when, I'm, when we talk to customers, this is a way where I'm trying to, it's still in the research phase. I won't say it's a product. We are doing POCs. We are doing POCs with companies where they get excited with the kind of data that we can collect, the kind of analytics we can do. But it's not a product. I wouldn't go as far as saying that. It's still in, uh, because, the, and the reason we want to work with those companies is they know this space. They are the ones who make money from this, right? They know the real problems. And we would like to, and they get excited with the technology, what technology can do. So think of this as two R&D departments or someone's IT department working with their with our R&D trying to see what new things we could do. I don't think it is, we don't think it's a product yet. Right? It's, uh, and as I was answering the earlier question, who owns what, who does what is still an open question. Right? So, yeah. yeah, since I, since I noticed that um, it seems like the major parts um, showing the slides here are more like the hardware parts, also like some software um, associated with them. Um, but if you're going to, um, like say, commercialize this with the growers, probably you also need to think up, think about some um, software after, like say, the growers upload it to to the clouds to the data database. Right. So, so that's, if that's, you're targeting yeah. on the scientists, right. probably you don't need to worry about those. Right. The scientists usually do the yeah. processing the analysis themselves, but right. then for the growers, probably they want something just just like click the button and then right. 
Tao. Yeah, so this is where I think, so we are working with uh, the Gates Foundation through the Terra program, right, the ARPA-E Terra program. And we are working with academics who are working in this space, leading researchers who are developing uh, things in, on top of this data. So once, so and in a way where right now, like the gantry system that Pat showed yesterday, these are super expensive systems, right? We are trying to see if we can approximate that through these kind of systems and get more people or new types of data, even with the gantry. If you, if you could get this thing streaming data all the time, you could get new, new features that you wouldn't have captured otherwise. And once you do that, we are still in that stage to be able to get more data and work with the experts to build new, new analytics. And once we do that, I think we'd have to go to the to the breeders and the growers and tell them, hey, you know what, this is what it is. Take this output and come up with something new. So this is, think of this as even on the computer science level, this is all cutting edge. And if we can marry this with the cutting edge that's happening in ag, we could come up with something which is really breakthrough, really disruptive. I hate to, well, I hate to, to wrap things up, but I want to give everybody a chance to get some coffee, but also thank you. Thank you. Thank you.